So welcome back, everybody, and uh, welcome to this lecture, which is going to mark the beginning of uh, what we normally call post heart refock methods. And uh, we have now uh, looked at FCI calculations and heart refock theory. And heart refock theory, as we saw, is a uh, something which we can interpret as a unitized transformation where we get rid of matrix elements which connect the ground state with all one particle, one whole excitations. And we zero out those matrix elements. Then uh, a hartree fock basis, as we discussed last week, can be seen as a kind of kitchen item. Mm -hmm. And uh, it normally serves the purpose of providing a uh, decent local minimum. And then we can build correlations on top of a hartree fock basis. So a hartree fock basis brings in a type of correlations which we call exchange correlations. And that is because the uh, uh, operator which we have for the interaction contains for fermions a direct term and an exchange term. So it has a minimal type of correlations and we normally call them for exchange correlations due to the nature of the uh, anti-symmetry of the wave function. So that's one type of correlations. Now this is not everything and you know that uh, when you dealt with uh, the first midterm you saw that uh, uh, when you diagonalize a one particle, one hole, the energy changed to the better. So you got a lower energy. And that corresponded uh, in a way to you doing hartree fock theory. Now, the uh, uh, thing is that if you were to uh, increase the dimensionality of the FCI calculations with a two particle, two hole basis, three particle, three hole excitations, and so on, you would get uh, an even lower energy. And it's normally this tiny energy difference which we are hunting for. So you may ask, you may ask, I mean, why are we not happy with Hartree Fock? So Hartree Fock, depending on the type of problem you have, uh, can give a decent approximation to the ground state, or it can give a pretty rough one, but a better one than a given basis, which is not optimized for the system. And then you would have to label with the additional methods to construct uh, the uh, additional contributions to the correlation energy. So the uh, the basic thing we are going to do now is actually to try to bake in correlations of the type two particle, two hole, three particle, three hole. There will be methods which are systematic where you can sum to infinite order specific types of correlations. And then you have methods which are given by a perturbative expansion in the interaction. And uh, these methods provide, when you now do a Taylor expansion, order by order in terms of the interaction, they're going to provide different types of correlations. And today we're going to see that uh, if we now stop at second order perturbation theory, we are going to recover excitations of the two particle, two hole type. But only those. We will include one particle, one hole, and two particle. Two. Then if we move on to uh, the third order, then we can bake in free particle, free hole excitations, and so forth. But these correlations will only be summed to a given order. When you diagonalize, you have this type of two particle, two hole correlations to infinite order in principle. If you do copper cluster theory, that's also another money body method that allows for a systematic resummation of correlations. So everything we are going to do now is an approximation to the full solution of the problem. The benefit here compared to a full configuration interaction theory is that we can have a much larger single particle basis. That means that we can also include many more Slater determinants of a specific excitation type. And we can sum these excitations to infinite order. In an FCI calculations, we are limited by the basis set that's where we truncate. And that basis set translates into a money body basis, which then defines a configuration and then defines the size of the Hamiltonian matrix to diagonalize. So clearly, this is a limited uh, basis set. It's a limited basis set you can operate with. Whereas here, the benefit in many of these approximative methods is that we can have a much larger single particle basis. And that may capture features of your wave function, which uh, you may not capture with uh, an FCI calculation. So sometimes if you're calculating 
the expectation values of the root mean square radius, which is very important for many transitions like electromagnetic transitions. If you're looking at the dipole transition, you will have to calculate the expectation value of R squared. And R squared is very sensitive to the tail of the wave functions. And then clearly, if you have a truncated basis, you may not catch the properties of the wave function at large distances. So there are many pros and cons here. And the, the, uh, the important thing for us is actually to see uh, the differences between the methods, uh, obviously also how we can use them and how we can uh, use them and calculate useful properties, but then also to realize what are the limits of the different methods. So what I'm going to do now is actually to bring back a little bit about the uh, uh, theorem of Thales and uh, one particle, one whole excitations. And I'm going to link that with the FCI calculations. And then uh, we are going to use this as an input to many body perturbation theory. And then by linking these methods, you hopefully see the differences and the pros and the cons of the methods. Okay. So I'm going to switch to the uh, to the whiteboard here. So let's do that quickly. And um, so what we have now is a uh, our first lecture on post hartley fock methods. And one of the things which we are going to do now is actually to link the uh, uh, Hartree Fock theory with FCI and also to uh, use this as a way to bridge the gap between many body perturbation theory. So, one of the things which we discussed last week was Thaler's theorem without proving it. So, today we are going to bring it back again. And Thaler's theorem, what that states is that our ground state, phi zero, which we have defined in terms of the different excitation no, and the creation operators up to n here. This is given by an A of i dagger acting on zero. And we also label this as state C here. This is something which we can rewrite in terms of an exponential. So this is what Thaler's theorem states. So it states that a uh, general Slater determinant can be written out in terms of the sum over all the particle hole excitations. And then we have these coefficients, which when we, we know that when we diagonalize, then we find these coefficients immediately. And in project number, you know, in the first midterm, what you did was to diagonalize a Hamiltonian matrix. And then you had only one particle, one hole, and zero particle, zero hole ex states. And that means that when you diagonalize the eigenvectors you got, they were represented by these coefficients. And then you have an AA and an AI. And this is acting on the ground state here. Uh, we are making an important assumption. And this assumption is that these two states, this C prime and C is not equal to zero. So we have an, uh, an, an overlap which cannot be neglected. Now, one thing which we also did last week, uh, if you uh, look back at the expression here, we know that we can take one of the sums. Uh, I don't remember what, what's the name of that rule. I think it's not it's not the Bernoulli rule. I have to always to look up the names of these uh, rules, but you can, uh, replace the sum over i with a product over i's. I don't know if you remember these expressions for exponentials uh, with the sums as arguments. And uh, uh, just to give you a quick example, if you have an exponential of, let's say, n y here, just let me remind you of that. This can be written out as the exponential. Suppose now this uh, n is a constant, uh, which now sums over all the numbers k up from one to n multiplied with y. This is something which you can rewrite. I don't know if you've seen this in your math courses. There's a name, there's a name of the theorem. I always I always have to look it up again. I think it's the exponential product rule or something like that. 
So that means that you can rewrite this Slater determinant C, which we have here. That can be rewritten in terms of a product of I equal uh, of all this, the single particle states below the Fermi level. So these I's, they sum all single particle states up to the Fermi level. And then we can write this out. If we now write out the exponential, we would have one plus, and then we have the uh, first term where we sum A is over all states above the Fermi level, C, I, A. And then we have a creation operator for the state A, and then one for I. And then we have a high order terms because now I'm just writing out the exponential. So what I would have then is a factor one over uh, two factorial. And then I have, I square the term with um, C, I, A, A, I, no, A, A, and A, I. So this term is squared. And then we have all the high order terms here, multiplied with C. Now, when you, when you do that, what you have is actually, if you now look at what we have done, uh, we know that if we look at the second term here, that second term, uh, and also if we look at the exponentials, there's something also to keep in mind about the exponentials, is that if we are, I take these pairs of operators of A, B, A, J, it's actually easy to convince yourself that they commute. Uh, I don't know how familiar you, you are with it, but there's something which is called the baker campbell haustoff theorem. But that says that uh, uh, in case the operators commute, if you have a E to the with an argument A and an argument B, this can be written as A plus B if A and B commute. Thank you. Yeah, we just switched the auditorium. Yeah, no. no, we did. We did that because we had the uh, uh, the other people have taken it, and uh, we thought that probably people were a little bit. <laughs> no, no problem. Yeah. yeah. So just to re remind, uh, to repeat for those of you who came now, uh, what we are doing now is to start with money-body perturbation theory, and we want to link this with what we have done before with FCI theory and uh, and Hartle-Fock theory. So one of the things which we're looking at is something which is called the Thaulis theorem. So the other thing which uh, is important in this expansion, so what we use here is Thaulis theorem says that I can write the Slater determinant, which has a non-zero overlap with a vacuum state, just another Slater determinant. I can write that uh, as an exponential, which it contains a sum over all the particle whole excitations, one particle, one whole excitations. So this is uh, uh, quite uh, linked up with the uh, Hartree Fock theory discussions which we have. And we actually use that expression there to look at the stability of the Hartree Fock equations. So what you would have then, uh, one, because these quantities commute. So when we have this, actually this product of operators, since they commute, we can actually look at this as a linear uh, sum over all the operators. And here, uh, what's also interesting, if you look at the squared term and the higher order term, this term here, this has already fixed A of I. So that means that when you operate with these squared terms, when you open it up, what you're going to have is A larger than F. There's going to be a CIA, CAAI, and this is multiplied. And now, since I'm just uh, computing the uh, the uh, operator squared, so this will contain a sum of a coefficient b, but it's still an i here because we have written the sum with i outside, so i is fixed. So that's a given whole state. And that means that I have an a, b of i here, and this is now acting on this vacuum state, which we have chosen. And you see that all the high order terms, they have to be equal to zero. And the reason why they have to be equal to zero is first, uh, when we are now looking at the uh, uh, action of this uh, set of operators on the, on the vacuum state, 
we know that the a, a whole state and a particle state, they can never be the same. So we can always reshuffle AI here. So this is going to be proportional to, I'm just writing it like this, AI squared acting on C. So all the higher order terms, what they produce is something which is proportional with AI of N acting on C. And we know that these terms are zero. When N, when N is larger than one. That allows us to uh, simplify the expression. So we have used this product rule for exponentials. And that allows us now to rewrite the uh, this new Slater determinant in terms of a product over all the whole states which we have. And this is going to contain a one plus, and now I have this uh, sum over A, and then I have my C, I, A, A, A dagger of A, I, and this is acting on the vacuum state. So this looks very much like what we did uh, in connection with full configuration interaction theory, where we simply had a Slater determinant which contained all the one particle, one hole excitations, one which contained all the two particle, two hole, et cetera, et cetera. Now, there's more to the picture than meets the eye here, because I'm bringing this up because later, another money body method we're going to look at is called copper cluster theory. And copper cluster theory is widely used in many fields uh, of physics and quantum chemistry. And in copper cluster theory, we're actually going to assume that we can have the wave function as an exponential over different particle hole excitations. Okay. I'm coming back to that a little bit later. So this is the, uh, uh, if we now look at that, uh, what we can uh, do further is to write out the action of this uh, uh, set of operators on the vacuum state. So this is the same as this P of I, this product of all the states below the Fermi level of A, and then we have a CI, A, A of A dagger, A I. And this is now acting on A I one dagger. So I'm using the I here to indicate that these are states below the Fermi level and up to the last state which is occupied. And there we have the zero state here. Now we can reshuffle this because we know that the, if you now look at these expressions, uh, we can rewrite this in terms of the following. So we can have now a term which goes like one plus, and then I have a sum over A, C, A, and then I1, and then I have an A, 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 I1, and this is multiplied with A, I1 dagger. So remember now that this is a product, and this product is going now to contain I1, I2, I3, etc. So I can then uh, permute the operators so that I, by doing all the permutations, I can actually rewrite this one in terms of uh, this specific sets of products where I have one, and then I have A of C, I, A, two here, A, 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 I, two, and then I have an A, I, two dagger. And this goes all the way down to the final state. So I have one plus the sum over the particle states, C, I, I, N, I, A, dagger, I, I, N. So I have to be, just have to, when, I, when I'm writing all these terms here, I just have to pronounce them correctly. So that should be I N, and this is a dagger. And this is acting on the true vacuum state. Now, this is something which I then can rewrite in a more general way as just a product over I and A I dagger plus a sum over the states above the Fermi level of A I dagger acting on the true vacuum state. And the reason for that is that if you look at each one of these, when they act on the vacuum state, you create a particle in the state I n, and then you destroy it. So that means that the action of this second term here 
this term here on the true vacuum state is just to create a state and then destroy it again. And then you're simply left with this term here. Now, if you look closer at this, this is something which we could define as a new operator of B of I dagger. So in essence, when we did the uh, Hartree-Fock uh, calculations and we looked at the stability of Hartree-Fock theory in second quantization, we were just varying these coefficients here. And when we derived the stability of the equations, uh, our Hartree-Fock calculations were based on us varying the link between the states below the Fermi level and excitations above the Fermi level. Now, there is a problem here because in general, uh, this sum here doesn't run freely. So this sum is actually constrained by being uh, defined by states above the Fermi level. So if you want to prove, because this would actually be the same as a general Slater determinant as we've seen it before. So we have an operator, B of I, acting on a true vacuum mm -hmm. state. However, it's not general enough because uh, the sum over A is limited. So if the sum over A had run over all the states, uh, then we would have a complete match here. However, you see the uh, uh, when we did Hartree-Fock theory, what we ended up with then is something which uh, looks like a mixture of the creation operators for the whole states plus a contribution from particle states. So this is another way of interpreting the Hartree-Fock uh, money body state. So we have a we can actually rewrite a general uh, Slater determinant. And, and keep in mind now that this is just a general Slater determinant. It's not a correlated wave function. So the if you think back to the uh, uh, true ground state, which we did in uh, full configuration interaction theory, that was given by a coefficient C0 times this uh, Slater determinant, which we use as an ansatz for the ground state. And then it contained all these additional terms, AI, and uh, we had these coefficients here, and then we had the multiplied with the state. This is a new set of Slater determinants. And we had the two particle, two whole states. And then we had a C, I, we just brought it like this. And let me just rewrite the coefficients here, because this is not the way we wrote them. So we had a C, I, A here, and then we had a two particle, two whole state. So these are just Slater determinants, which now uh, do not have any relation to the money body state, except that we are making an expansion of the exact wave function in terms of this basis. And then we had all the high order terms here. So this was a two particle, two whole excitation. And this is a one particle, one whole excitation. Now, what Thales theorem says is that we can approximate a Slater determinant. That means one of uh, these guys, which you see here. Oops, oops. One of these guys, or one of these guys here, or one of the other ones, in terms of uh, a general one particle, one whole excitation here. And then this uh, one particle, one whole excitation is now defined in terms of this new operator B of I here. So the thing we need to prove is that this is general enough that we can use this to define uh, a basic Slater determinant. So let's uh, take a look at that. And uh, I'm going back to the, uh, to the slides here. And the uh, proof for that is something which we have in the uh, in the lecture notes from uh, the previous week. So let's take a look at that. So if we now go back to uh, the uh, Hartree-Fock representation and the stability of the Hartree-Fock calculations, if we scroll down a little bit and look at Thaulis theorem, uh, what we have here is actually the definition of uh, the new operator, as you saw in the in the on the handwritten notes. 
And what we have now is a Slater determinant, which is defined in terms of this operator here. So meaning that the new representation of the Slater determinant in second quantization looks like our previous one. However, the, the representation is not general enough because you're summing or you have a limit or restriction on the summation of the intermediate states here. So the single particle states have uh, all to be above the Fermi level. The question then is whether you can construct a general representation of a Slater determinant with a creation operator of this type here, where you now have some coefficients and where these FIP are matrix elements of a unitary matrix, which transforms our creation and annihilation operators, A dagger and A to B and B and some operator B tilde. This should be actually a B tilde here. I see that the slides, I mean, it's a little bit shifted. Let me see if the other format is better. I didn't notice that before now. Now, it, there's something which shifts my... So there should be actually a B tilde here. And uh, this B tilde is, is actually a general uh, operator now, which is represented by unitary transformation of the previous ones. This is pretty common. So if you... Uh, uh, are ending up studying things like superconductivity, you can actually rewrite the uh, creation and annihilation operators in terms of a transformation, which leads to quasi-particle operators, which involve particles and whole states. So this is something you can do in general. The, uh, the special thing now is that we have a, a, an operator B, which is defined in terms of the whole states, plus this sum here, which now contains only the uh, states above the Fermi level. So you can now define a Slater determinant tilde here in terms of this B tilde operators. And then you can show that uh, uh, this op new Slater determinant C tilde is actually identical to this C prime, which we started with. And uh, what you assume now is that, again, the overlap between the... Uh, vacuum state you've chosen, the uh, reference state, and this new uh, state is actually different from zero. So you're assuming that there is a non-zero overlap. That's a very important aspect when you're proving uh, these things. Because else, that means that this new determinant would not be equivalent to the previous one, right? So what we are simply stating with this, this assumption is actually important because you could have now tried to do the same thing with a three particle, three whole Slater determinant or a two particle, two whole Slater determinant. In that case, you would have found that uh, this would actually turn out to be much more difficult to prove. Uh, I actually don't know if such a proof exists. Uh, so the assumption we've made is that we start with this particle whole excitations. And then with uh, that, we know that this is nothing but just a determinant, which you see here. And we want this determinant to be one. We want to have this as a normalization criterion. And if you do that, you have the standard orthogonality criteria for the inverse matrix elements. So when you go run through the calculations, then you can actually define this uh, new uh, operators, which we had, this B in terms of the AK, plus these terms here, where we actually now run over all possible single particle states but some of the uh, matrix elements here may be zero. And that, when you do the algebra here, you can rewrite it in terms of uh, this quantity CKP. And this CKP is something which now gives us uh, the standard equation which we had when we started with the expressions. So that means that this AK plus this term here is equal to the operator BOK which we had. So we can actually define a new Slater determinant, which now contains this one particle, one whole excitations in terms of this new modified creation operator. And there's a new annihilation operator, which also corresponds to that. And uh, with that, uh, what we did later was simply to vary these coefficients. And varying these coefficients, we could then uh, prove the stability equations for hartree fock theory. And this is something uh, we are going to look a little bit more in the exercises tomorrow with the Lipkin model. So in the Lipkin model, we're actually going to do the Hartree-Fock calculation. And then with the Hartree-Fock calculation, you can then 
and the stability conditions, you can then find out, depending on the strength of the matrix elements, you can figure out the uh, uh, matrix elements, which will lead to stable hot reflux solutions, and the values of the matrix elements, which will lead to unstable hot reflux solutions. And that's extremely useful, because then you can just read off specific matrix elements. So what we did last week was actually to look at this as an hot reflux ansatz, where we now simply vary these coefficients here using this new operator. But the starting point is actually us now uh, rewriting the uh, ansatz for the Hamil for this for the Slater determinant in terms of a sum over particle hole excitations, exponent shaded. And then due to the fact that uh, uh, these operators here, they commute, and also the fact that when we rewrite it using the product rule for exponentials, then we end up with an expression which looks like this for that Slater determinant. So this is something which we will carry with us when we start with the copper cluster theory. So this was a, just a proof of the Thaulis theorem. Now, the thing which is interesting for us now, when we go back to the, uh, to the notebook, so let's just go back to that one. Okay. So let me just try to do this again. So it's not always that it comes up here. Huh? Oops. Sometimes it doesn't. We had this problem last week as well here. So let me just try it again. Just holding here. So what we are going to do now when we have this uh, type of operator, what we uh, can say is the following. So if you look at this Slater determinant, general Slater determinant, which we wrote as an exponential, and then the sum over all these one particle, one whole excitations, C, I, A, and then we have the A, 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 I of C here. So this is a Slater determinant, which has a non-zero overlap with a true vacuum state. And we could now define this in terms of an operator T1, which now simply contains the sum over all the one particle, one whole excitations. And you see now that the, this specific state here, C prime, could now be rewritten in terms of E of this operator T1 acting on the vacuum state. So this is a pretty general way to express the sum of all one particle, one whole excitations. What we are going to define later in connection with copper cluster theory is that we could define an operator T. This is actually called the exponential ansatz for the wave function. So we can now include uh, all types of excitation. So this is a one particle, one whole excitation. We have a T2 here plus a T3 up to an operator Tn, which now runs over all the one, all, all the particles which we have and creates a n particle, n hole excitation. This is a two particle, two hole. This is a three particle, three hole. And then if we have n particles, we end up with a, a n, np, and n hole excitations. So we can actually rewrite that, and that means that the exact wave function or the exact uh, ground state uh, can now be rewritten in terms of uh, this new operator, this exponential ansatz, multiplied with the original state phi zero here, which we also label as C. So if I have this C prime, that means that uh, if my state is now proportional to C prime, that means that what I have is just the operator T1 acting on phi, on phi zero. So this is definitely an approximation. 
I can make further approximations. And I can approximate this one with E of T1 plus T2 multiplied with the ansatz for the ground state and so forth. So this is normally called an truncation at the level of single excitations, one particle, one hole, and double excitations, two particle, two hole. So that's a kind of naming which you will find in the literature. So one particle, one hole is called singles or single excitation. And a two P, two hole is called a double excitation. So what you will often see is that this is being labeled as a, a truncation of the exact wave function on the level of single and double excitations. Now, there's an interesting thing here. So there's a reason why I bring this up, is that due to the exponential character here, you have an infinite summation of one particle, one hole, and two particle, two hole summations, uh, excitations. And you bring in these correlations to infinite order because the exponential is actually, uh, when you write it out, is gonna contain two particle, two hole excitations to high orders. And this is a way by which we will construct many body correlations to infinite order. This comes back when we are looking at copper cluster theory. So this is just a small digression uh, for what is going to come. Uh, now I just wanted to make the link between Hartree-Fock theory. So if you're doing Hartree-Fock theory, that means that you can now express your wave function for the ground state in terms of an operator T1 and this exponential ansatz where you sum up all the one particle, one whole excitations. And that is mixed, these excitations are mixed with the ground state ansatz which you have. So this is a, a more compact way of setting it up and we will see the usage of this in more detail when we come to copper cluster theory. When we do many body perturbation theory, which is our next topic, we are actually going to look at this exponential expansion order by order. So when we come to second order in many body perturbation theory, we will just have a one particle, one whole excitations to order two and so on. And we are going to see how this uh, changes the way we are going to look at the, the calculations now. Now, there's one thing here, when you look at these type of excitations, is that these coefficients which we have here, these coefficients are not the same as our FCI coefficients, because the FCI coefficients, they come from the diagonalization of a problem. So what you will see later is that we are going to rewrite this in terms of a new set of coefficients, TIA multiplied with AI and a, a, a and AI. So these uh, coefficients are normally called amplitudes. And we have the different ways of computing these amplitudes depending on the money body theory we have. So in uh, an FCI calculation, what you end up doing there is to diagonalize your problem. And when you diagonalize, you just read off the eigenvectors. And this is essentially what you did in the midterm here. If you, on the other hand, do many body perturbation theory, we are going to have an approximation to this term here. And the same with copper cluster theory and any other many body method. So what I wanted to bring in now, so this is just background for how we can generalize the uh, exact wave function in terms of specific excitation operators. We did it when we set up the FCI calculations. So what we are going to start with now is a totally new topic. And that's something where I'm going to use the acronym MBPT. So which stands for Money Body Perturbation Theory. In essence, this is going to be a Taylor expansion in terms of the interaction which we have. So what we need now are just some few ingredients before we take a small break. So what we have is our exact wave function, which then can be expanded in terms of a set of slater determinants, as we discussed earlier. 
And so we have the Slater determinant for the ground state ansatz. And then we had this sum, which we rewrote in terms of particle hole excitations, but we can also rewrite it just in a in terms of a general list of Slater determinants, which form our basis. So that means that we could now simply have a sum over m, and then we have a coefficient c uh, zero m, and this is multiplied with a given Slater determinant m here. And we're assuming that the basis which you see here, this basis and these states here, they form a complete basis. That's the assumption which we are making. So after the break, we are going to derive money body perturbation theory, the general expressions for money body perturbation theory. And then we're going to look at how we can interpret these coefficients here. And then how we can relate them to an FCI calculation and to a Hartree Fock calculation. So money body perturbation theory in a nutshell is nothing but a Taylor expansion, a Taylor expansion in terms of the interaction and, and the uh, unperturbed energies of the system. And that gives us a recipe where we can calculate order by order every term without introducing any unknown parameters. Because everything which we have order by order is going to be well-defined. So we're going to pause the recording. So what we're going to do now is to uh, derive uh, the uh, uh, expression for the correlation energy uh, using many body perturbation theory. And we're going to present two variants, one which is called bruen wigner perturbation theory, which will depend on the exact energy and is not very much used. And then we have something which is called Rayleigh-Schrodinger perturbation theory. Now, one thing I wanted to remind you of, uh, because there are going to be some small differences so that we uh, can see what are the differences between uh, FCI theory when it comes to the correlation energy and money body perturbation theory. So if we look back at this correlation energy quantity, which we defined in terms of uh, the one particle, one hole, and two particle, two hole excitation, so what we did was actually to define that uh, for FCI calculations. So let's look at that first and remind ourselves about what we found. So in that specific case, what we had is an energy delta E, and this is just for the FCI case, and that's given by the exact energy minus this energy, which we called E0, which was the reference energy. And we put a ref on this one. And this E is the exact energy of the ground state. In that case, we have the Hamiltonian op acting on the exact wave function, and that's given by E times psi zero. So we're just looking at the ground state. We're going to target the ground state of many body systems now. We will be uh, less interested in this course on excited states, but you can use this machinery to calculate the energies of excited states as well. And we had this quantity E0 ref, which was then given by a sum over all the states below the Fermi level, where we had the uh, matrix elements of the, the un, what we call the unperturbed operator, plus the sum, a factor of a half, because we are summing freely. And then we had this ij v of ij anti-symmetrized. This was a reference energy which we calculated uh, in FCI, in full configuration interaction theory. And we could actually rewrite this delta E when we did the calculations. This could be written out in a specific form where we had the sum over the particle hole states. And then we had a CIA. And this was multiplied with the matrix elements. And we could calculate these matrix elements this is H of phi of Ia. This is a one particle, one whole term, plus the sum over the uh, two particle, two whole excitations. And this is under the assumption that the Hamiltonian doesn't contain more 
than interactions which act on two particles at most. If we have a three particle uh, interaction, then we would get an additional term from three particle free hole excitations. But this is a quantity when we now diagonalize, we can find these coefficients from the diagonalization, and then we can simply plug them in and calculate the expectation value of the correlation energy. So this is a two particle, two hole state. And this is something which uh, got an explicit expression, which we could rewrite in the following form. So we had then a sum over AI and then a CIA. And since we are using a, a, a new vacuum state, we need to normalize the Hamiltonian with respect to that vacuum state. And in this specific case, this was given by this operator F of A. I'm not gonna repeat the definition of it, plus, this sum over A and B, I and J, and C, I, J, A, B. And then we had the matrix elements, I, J of V of A, B. These were the explicit expressions, which we ended up with when we calculated these uh, matrix elements between many body states. So there's one thing I want you to keep in mind now when we move on to many body perturbation theory, that we start with a money body state. This is a money body state. This is a money body state. This is a money body state. Same with that one. But what we have done when we use Wick's theorem, or if we don't use Wick's theorem, just calculate the matrix elements, then we end up with a sum over one body operators, and they are matrix elements, and two body operators. So keep in mind that these expressions, they stem from a, a many body uh, matrix elements, which we have calculated. And these many body matrix elements, they reduce to simple expressions due to the form of the Hamiltonian. So you could choose to just keep it like this, or since we have defined these operators, then they can be rewritten in terms of these simpler equations. So that means that what we need to tabulate in this specific case are just these matrix elements and these matrix elements. And when we diagonalize, we get these coefficients. And then it's a simple matter of just setting up uh, this as a matrix, this is a matrix, and this is actually just a matrix matrix multiplication, what you have there. And the same here, this is actually simpler because this becomes a vector matrix, a vector vector multiplication. So this is, if you think in terms of computations, these are things which we can calculate easily. So FCI gives us the answers in terms of these coefficients, but it's gonna give us a limited basis because this basis grows quickly. And this is normally what's called the exponential wall, which you meet in many body physics, because you have an exponential growth of states when you increase the single particle basis. So with the FCI calculations, you will be limited by the number of slater determinants which you can put up these ones. And that means also that you will have to uh, 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 limit the number of terms here. Whereas when we're going to do many body perturbation theory, we can actually have a large set of single particle states. Okay, so let's now, this was just a reminder. And you know that when we did Hartree-Fock theory, so with Hart, if we look at this term here with Hartree-Fock, HF, this term is actually equal to zero. So if you have a Hartree-Fock basis, it's only the second term which pops up. But then you have to replace the single particle states with Hartree-Fock single particle states. So Hartree-Fock actually simplifies the calculation forms. So uh, the reason why I bring this up is I want you to keep this in mind because if you can diagonalize, this is the answer. And then you can compare many body perturbation theory to this pop case here. Okay, so what we're going to do now is actually to go back to Schrodinger's equation. So we started before the break, we actually started with this term here. And let's go back to that one. And uh, let's bring in some further definitions here. So define 
following quantities. So we have H0 acting on this uh, phi zero. And you remember that we assume now that the single particle basis is an eigenbasis of little h zero. And that means that since we make a Slater determinants from this basis, then uppercase h zero has as eigenstates these phi zeros and phi one and so on. So this is a, a eigenstates of that specific part of the Hamiltonian. So that could be, let's say, harmonic oscillator, for instance. Or like you had in the midterm, it could be the uh, single particle basis for the hydrogen atom, for instance, which is often used in atomic and molecular physics. Another thing which we are going to assume now is something which is called intermediate normalization. And that means that the psi zero is not normalized. This is something which is handy when we are looking at the, the perturbative expansion. So we're simply going to assume that this one is equal to one. We know that phi zero and phi zero is equal to one. So we're assuming that psi zero is not normalized when we start here, then we have to normalize it. <laughs> this is just a kind of a trick which is used in order to get rid of some constants. Next, what we do now is that we look at Schrodinger's equation. So we assume that psi zero is an eigenstate of the, the full Hamiltonian. And this gives us now the energy of psi zero. Now we are targeting the ground state of the system, but this could be an state if we just replace the wave function with another state. And then uh, what I'm going to do next is simply to multiply like we did in the FCI calculation. I multiply from the left. So I compute the integral from the left with uh, phi zero. And that means that what I have then is the following integral of h of psi zero, which is simply equal to e due to this trick with intermediate normalization. Then, uh, what I'm going to do then is to uh, also look at the term with, uh, and remember now that the Hamiltonian is assumed to be an emission operator. So if I look at the quantity here, this quantity, this is simply just going to be equal to W0, which is now what we call the sum of the unperturbed energies. And you know that this W0 in our case, it's just the sum over all the energies below the Fermi level, as we calculated in the very beginning of the semester. So then the correlation energy here is different from the one which we have in FCI calculation. So we have to be a little bit careful now. So the correlation energy here is not the same as in FCI. So we're going to define the many body perturbation theory relation energy and that's going to be given by e minus w zero so i just take the difference of these two equations so that means that this term is actually equal to this quantity phi zero and then i have the interaction piece multiplied with psi zero here so i'm just subtracting e minus w zero and that means that I then have, because you remember that H is just H zero. I have to remember to put hats here. H zero plus H of I. So when I subtract the two, I'm simply left with this term, which you see here. So that defines now my correlation energy. And later we're going to see how we can link this with the FCI correlation energy which is going to be the same as the copper cluster one. So many body perturbation theory has a slight redefinition. So it's just important to keep that in mind because when people say the correlation energy, you would have to be a little bit more specific. Is it the FCI correlation energy or the many body perturbation correlation energy? So, uh, so this is, defines the correlation energy. And then uh, what we're going to do next now is to uh, 
set up the uh, projection operators. So I'm going to define an operator now, which contains only the ground state. We are not limited to that. We could have more states. So if I want to look at excited states in a limited space, I could now define this one to be given by more slated determinants. And you see also that this has a property that P squared is equal to P. This is something which we discussed in the very beginning of the semester. This is a matrix. Just keep that in mind. Actually, this has only one element here. So, <laughs> amazing. yeah. But in principle, if you were to define a sum here, so that means that we can now define a sum from M equal to one and in principle to infinity because we have an infinite basis of slater determinants. And this is something which we defined in the very beginning of the semester. And it's easy to see that this operator squared is equal to the operator itself. And then that P plus Q, as we also defined in the beginning of the semester, is just the identity. And then there's another relation which is pretty obvious to show is that P times Q is equal to Q times P and that's equal to zero. That means that Q and P commute. It's pretty easy to set up these relations, but we have also another property which is very useful, going to be useful for us is that H zero, since the basis we have chosen is an eigenbasis of H0. It means that these guys also commute. Then just keep in mind that we have defined, so these operators are defined in terms of this basis, and this basis is an eigenbasis of H0. So this just follows from the definitions which we have done. So that means that I can actually rewrite my Slater determinant here, phi zero, is something which I can formally rewrite in terms of P plus Q and multiplied with this phi psi zero. Okay. So that means that P projects out a, a component in the exact wave function, which is now uh, defined within the space of the ground state. And Q projects out the remaining degrees of freedom in your exact wave function, which we don't have. So what I'm going to do now is to introduce a dummy variable. So just a constant. It's a constant to Schrodinger's equation. And if you think of Schrodinger's equation, um, this can be, as we have seen, this can be rewritten in terms of H0 plus H of I. And we add and subtract it. So we call this omega and add and subtract. This omega multiply with psi zero to both sides of Schrodinger's equation. So that means that I can actually rewrite Schrodinger's equation in terms of this H0 acting on the exact wave function. And this is equal. So the only thing I'm doing now is a rewrite of the Schrodinger equation without introducing anything new. And you may ask, what's the benefit of that? Because this is just looks like a complication of the original equation. Then we make an assumption here. We make an assumption, remember now that H0 uh, is going to act on a set of states. So in principle, this is an operator which uh, uh, produces a matrix since we have a discrete finite basis. So we assume also that the inverse, one over omega minus H0 exists. So omega is just a scalar. This is called the resolvent. So if you're doing Green's function theory, you actually, in practice, instead of uh, doing a Taylor expansion here, 
you're actually inverting a matrix. So Green's function theory is matrix inversion in practice. So this is called the resolvent. And the thing here is that H0 is known. If you were to put the uh, full Schrodinger equation, this is just an alternative of rewriting Schrodinger's equation. If you have a, if you think of Schrodinger's equation, you can rewrite that in terms of a matrix inversion problem. If you can invert the exact energy minus H, H. If that one exists, inverting that matrix is the same as solving Schrodinger's equation. Yeah. Uh, what's, what's kind of the interpretation of the operator being in the denominator? It feels kind of strange. They are one over an operator, let's say one over the dx. Yeah. How does that act on something? Well, yeah, the, this, I mean, if you Taylor expand it, mm -hmm. you're just going to get h, h squared, h cubed, yeah, okay. and so on. Yeah, yeah. And that acts on the states. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and that gives you the same expectation. Yeah. Are we assuming that uh, H0 is diagonal? No, it doesn't need to be diagonal. Okay. So that's really the inverse. Yeah. So now it's you can think of this as matrices. But this is not the inverse. Or, or... No, this is the inverse. Well, so that means that what you're assuming now is that omega minus H0 inverse exists. So this is the inverse. Hmm? So you denote the inverse matrix with yeah. the yeah. denominator. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So this is a, uh, yeah, it's a little bit. So this is actually a, a better notation since we're dealing with operators. So. Yeah. But people normally rewrite it in terms of that. So, and this one, I don't know how familiar you are with that kind of notation. If you go into the theory of Green's functions, this is pretty common to do. And th this leads to something which is called the propagator. And uh, you can then rephrase your money body theories in terms of matrix inversion problems. We're going to see an example of that a little bit later when we look at look back at Hartree Fock theory and these stability conditions for Hartree Fock theory and what is normally called the Tam Dankov approximation. This is actually a problem where we can rewrite everything in terms of a a matrix inversion problem, and then find the exact solution. We're coming back to that a little bit later. But I wanted to just go through the basics here of money body perturbation theory. So if you now look at this equation here, what we're going to do now is to assume that we can multiply from the left with the inverse of that operator. So that means that uh, what we have then when we perform the multiplications is that we can now rewrite psi zero in terms of one divided by omega minus this h zero and multiply with omega minus e plus h of i and multiply with psi zero. The next thing we do now is that we can multiply this quantity with the operator q. So if I multiply this quantity with, because I'm interested in the contribution from the excluded space. I know the contribution from the space which defines my ground state because that's just defined by phi zero. So I already have that one. I know how to calculate things. But what I'm interested in now is actually the contribution because if you look at the, the ground state, the exact ground state, is something which we now, when we act with this one on that, that is simply going to include the action of this guy. So that's give, going to give me phi zero due to this intermediate normalization. But then I have all the junk which comes from these guys. And these are those which are going to give me the additional correlations here. So if I do that multiplication, what we're going to have is Q. And now we have one over omega minus h0. And what I can do is actually to rewrite this as p times q. So this is the identity, which I can always insert in here. So remember now that what we are setting up are matrices. So we have omega minus e 
plus hi, and this is multiplied with psi zero. So let's look a little bit closer. What we have now is Q of one over omega minus h zero, and this is multiplied with P plus Q. So we have said that h zero commutes with P and Q. So if you now look at the denominator, if you think of that in terms of a Taylor expansion, then you will have h, h squared, h cubed, and so on, popping up. And that means that what you're going to have now are terms which have q. So if you look at a given term like q of h zero of p, we know that these commute. So this is the same as q times p times h zero. And we know that this is zero. So that means that this term here becomes simply equal to Q of omega minus H zero times Q times one. And then I know that Q commutes with the H zero. So I can actually rewrite this as Q squared. So this means that this term here becomes the same as Q squared. I can put it up here of one over omega minus h zero. Q squared is equal to Q. These are idempotent operators. So this is the same as Q of one over omega minus h zero. And it's normally written like this of Q of omega minus h zero. And this reads a sum over m equal one to infinity of phi of m phi of n divided by omega minus h zero. If we do that, we can now start rewriting what we have. So if I now look at my uh, equations, what we have is something which doesn't look too practical. So we have a Q of, so actually, if I now rewrite the whole equation here, but let's, let's do this one. So of psi is something which I'm going to rewrite like Q of omega minus H zero, multiplied with omega minus E, just a constant, the energy plus H I acting on phi zero. Then I know that the total wave function is something I can write out as P plus Q times phi zero. And I know that P acting on phi zero due to this intermediate normalization is actually given by phi zero. So that means that my total wave function can be written out as phi zero plus this term Q. And sometimes you have to forgive me if I forget to put the hats on the operators here, of omega minus E. So what I've done here is just a rewrite of Schrodinger's equation. And it doesn't look like as we have gained anything at all, right? <laughs> so you have a, a, an equation now, which depends on two unknown quantities. So we have uh, the energy, which is unknown. And then we have the wave function here, which is unknown. So how should I proceed? So what's this? What's the simplest answer when you don't know, when you have an equation like this and you want to start calculating? Yes. To guess, <laughs> yes. And if since we now have made an assumption for the ground state, what is a useful guess? The energy is the energy of the ground state. No, I was thinking of the wave function of this. Oh. So if I want to make a guess here. Zero point. Yeah, exactly. So that means that uh, phi zero one, the next iteration, 
is now going to be given by phi zero plus Q of omega minus H zero, and then omega minus E plus H one times phi zero. Oops, sorry. And then I just plug this one back again into the expression, right? And then you get that phi zero of two is simply going to be given by phi zero. But then you're going to have now this term, and then you have a term to second order. So this is going to contain omega minus h zero. And then I have my omega minus e plus h i multiplied with phi zero, but then plus, and then I have q of omega minus h zero, and then I have omega minus e plus h i. Now this is squared times phi zero. And this continues because then you can actually do this to infinite order. You can do an infinity of iterations. And that means that what you would get would be a psi zero, which is simply a sum over i starting from one to infinity. And then you have a, an operator of Q of omega minus H zero. So I tend to forget to put all the hats here. Right? And then you have omega minus e plus h of i. And this is to the power of i multiplied with phi zero. Now, this again depends on e, which we don't know. So it doesn't look like as we have achieved anything at all. The correlation energy now is going to be given by this same quantity, i equal one, but now multiplied with phi zero, and then I have h of i. And this is then multiplied with all these animals here. Omega minus h zero of omega minus e plus h of i. And this is now to the power of i, and finally multiplied with phi zero here. So this is, in an iterative way, is nothing but a rewrite of Schrodinger's exact equation. So what we, what seemingly what we have done now is just to complicate life for ourselves. And it doesn't look like as if we have achieved anything at all. Now, what we need to do now is actually to, uh, since this omega is a variable, which we added and subtracted, this is something which we now can choose. And the choice we make here is going to define two different paths in many body theory. So we can now choose omega. Since this is just a parameter, we can put that one to uh, E, the exact energy. And this will lead to something which is called Brio N. It's going to be interesting to see how YouTube translates that one. Yeah. There were so many interesting translations of Hartree Fox. I had to take the print of yeah. Yeah. And uh, money body theory, money body theory, yeah. and so on. <laughs> Hartree Fox became uh, market fox theory. Market, yeah. <laughs> So seemingly, it's probably not in their machine learning uh, algorithms. <laughs> they haven't been trained with many body theory words. <laughs> and as you said, also Feynman diagrams became Fireman diagrams. Fireman. <laughs> <laughs> the, the whole concept theory became copper processing theory. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah. Actually, one thing which is fun, if you have subtitles on uh, on Zoom, you can put that on, on and you speak in Norwegian. Mm -hmm. It's desperately trying to translate that into English. 
and it just makes a horrible mess. <laughs> The same with yeah, yeah. But YouTube, on the other hand, does a perfect job with Italian because it has twelve languages, which is, has been trained to recognize the, um, the spoken words. Well, Google trains on everything in the internet, so yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah exactly. <laughs> okay, so what we have now, if I if I do that, then you can rewrite this equation. And now if you look at this expansion, which we are getting, uh, this is going to be equal to phi zero. And then you're going to have a term here, hi, obviously. And this hi here is a, a term which now is going to define first order contributions because it's going to be first order, first power in hi. And then we have a, uh, additional terms which go like h of i so we're just simply writing off what we have here and then we have a q multiplied with e minus h0 and now i'm just bringing q up again here and h of i so the next term is going to represent something which is to second order in the interaction matrix elements and then we have the next term, which is an h of i times q. And then we have e minus h0. And we have q. And we have h of i. And when we have q. And then we have 1 over e minus h0. And then we have a q again. And then we have an h of i. And this just continues till... Uh, infinite order in principle and multiplied with phi zero. So you can now recognize the different terms. So you have a first order term, you have a term in second order in interaction, you have a term in third order and so forth and so forth. Now, the only problem now is that we have something which depends on the exact energy. So you could solve this in an iterative way where you try different values for the exact energy and then you try to uh, iteratively improve upon that but this is something which is less practical and what's normally done and i'm just going to wrap up a little bit here before we stop for today uh, the standard choice is actually to rewrite uh, the expansion in terms of omega being defined by the unperturbed energies or the energies of h0 so what you would have then is omega given by W0. And that gives us what's normally called Rayleigh. Rayleigh, Rayleigh Schrodinger money body perturbation theory. MBPT. And this is where we're going to start tomorrow. And tomorrow, uh, after we've looked at the exercises, uh, as usual, from 8 to 10, we are then going to uh, look at what the contributions look like to first order, second order, and third order. And we're also going to introduce a diagrammatical representation of the different contributions. But the, the task tomorrow is then to look at how we can use either brienne wigner perturbation theory and rayleigh schrodinger perturbation theory and then see what kind of expressions we get and link those with the correlation energy we get from FCI and the correlation energy we get from hartree fock theory. And just see upon what kind of improvements these methods are actually gonna give us. So remember again, if you can diagonalize, you would obviously diagonalize. But the problem now, which we face, is that in principle, this contains an infinite sum. When we are going to compute the matrix elements, these infinite sums of a slater determinants are going to be replaced by infinite sums of a single particle states. And this is something which is easier to handle than just an infinite sum of a slater determinants in the FCI calculation. But don't you have to uh, invert 
to make it uh, one of the E minus uh, H. Thing. We're going to show that this turns out to just be the difference between the whole states and the single particle states. Oh, okay. And the benefit now, when you introduce like this uh, term here, this omega equal to W0, is that we know this term. And that means again, that when you look at the denominators here, this one, you're going to have a quantity which is known here. This is known. Uh, you're going to get an dependence on E here, which you can regroup and find order by order in terms of quantities which can be calculated exactly order by order and where you know how to calculate all integrals. So that's the benefit of really showing motivation theory. But then that leads to something which is called unlinked diagrams and poorly violating contributions. So you will get a simpler uh, expansion in terms of things you can calculate, but there is a price for it. And the price you have to pay is something which is called poorly violating diagrams, but you can show that you can actually cancel this order by order. And then you will get only terms which are called link diagrams. We are coming back to this. And these uh, terms, they can all be calculated without any problems.